Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 280. I am your host, Keith Andrew, and this is the Keith Andrew Network. I'm here with Ms. Brimberg, and I just want to say thank you for being a guest on my talk show. Thank you for having me. Now, for people who want to know what the Keith Andrew Network is, the whole point of my talk show is to show people that even with having a learning disability, I can still mount to something, and at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities, but you should never give up, and you should prove to people you can still mount to something. That labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be, and you should prove to people you can still mount to something. With that being said, half hour every time may go longer, depends on depends on the interview. Hope you're very talkative. <laughs> but with that being said, it's freedom of speech, freedom of self expression, gloves off, say anything you want, you know, it's this is America after all, so you can say whatever the hell you want. So with that being said, what can <laughs> With that being said, starting off, what can you tell us about yourself? Well, um, let's see. I, um, I'm an aspiring actress, writer, living in Connecticut, and I do um, a lot of my work. Uh, I, I do a little lot in Connecticut and uh, New York as well, and I just kind of find the arts is is very therapeutic. Um, it's, it's a way to express yourself, and and I find I find also with acting too, it's it's telling someone's story because you know anyone that's written it, most likely somebody who's written a story is based on either experiences they've had in their lives or people they've known, or, and I just I I find it I find it so such an honor to tell those stories and also push the envelope and, and make people question human nature, say, okay, I always thought I would react this way in a certain situation, but after seeing this, no, I, it, you know, make them question things. And so with the acting, I've um, also started to get into writing a little bit too, and I'm, I'm finding that I really, I really love that. And I kind of started late in life. It was, um, and a lot of, a lot of it too. I, I relate to what you you said because when I was in elementary school, many people told me um, because I had some pro I had problems, um, the learning difficulties. I didn't understand math very well, and I got a lot of low test scores. And I was told, you know, don't don't push yourself so hard because it's you know, it, it's not worth it. It's it's going to be too difficult for you. And I said no. I I refuse to believe that. And the older I got, I said no. I I, I refuse. I, I'm not going to listen to people. I'm going to do what what's in my heart. And um, I could never understand algebra, but I work in accounting. <laughs> I support myself as a, doing accounting work. And and I I firmly believe and. My mother, who was, was a high school teacher, she mostly said um, it's more or less it's your emotional intelligence that will get you through. Because a lot of people are maybe are intelligent, but she, there's people that you have to really want it. You have to push for it. You have to be passionate about it and work for it. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Gattaca. It had Ethan Hawke, Jubla. I heard about it. I never saw it. Right, but I just remember that movie made a huge impact on me because um, it's more or less like Ethan Hawke was kind of told, it, it took place in the future, and they did a DNA, DNA test on him when he was born, and they said, well, you're, you're, you just score average. Your DNA is, is average. But he said, no, I'm going to be an astronaut, and he went through the most extreme measures to get... To where he did, he finally he became an astronaut. But it it he oh man he he worked for it though <laughs> he really did when most people would have given up and 
that I think that that was a huge, um, that was a huge lesson that it's, it's more, I think it's your emotional intelligence that you, if you want something bad enough, you will get it. You'll do what it takes to get there. No, absolutely. It's basically, you know, like I was saying, labels, even if people label you, you know, that's not who you're going to be for the rest of your life. Exactly. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, for a, for a perfect example, um, you know, two things. One, the one movie that impacted my life was Almost Famous. And since I wanted, uh, since Almost Famous, I, for the one, say, what was it? I'm 28 now, so... 2004, I realized it was my sophomore year. Since uh, 2004, I wanted to be a personal assistant. And mm -hmm. I wanted to go on tour with a band. Right. I wanted to travel the world. And I did meet a, um, a roadie. You know, I was supposed to go on tour with her. And she disappeared. And... At that time, you know, that's what I wanted to do, and, you know, it, it fell through. But then I saw um, Suits, and it's like, oh, that's what I want. I want a boss like Harvey Specter. You know, I want to be like Mike Ross. And since then, I wanted to be an actor, and I tried taking acting classes, but, you know, it's too much money. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm just telling you the long story. That's the highlights. So first, I wanted to be a roadie, but that didn't work. Then I wanted to be an actor. It didn't work. Then I was like, well, I'm 21. I want to have a couple famous friends. You know, I don't drink. I'm like CM Punk. Um, I'm straight edge. And now for people who don't know who CM Punk, he's a former WWE wrestler. Now he's straight edge. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. And I was like, well, I have my health. I have my family. If I have to die, I would like to have a couple of famous friends. But unfortunately, I was being told to go fuck myself. I was being told to fuck off. I was being, I was told I was a low life, a parasite. We don't have time to do as people like you. It's not realistic. And so I gave up on that dream. And, you know, the reason how my talk all came out of it is basically, we're, imagine I'm at the table with you. And you're talking, you know, to, uh, to, to my brothers. They're like, oh, well, you can go to the city and you can do this and you can do that. And I would jump in and say, what about me? And, and they, everyone stops and looks at me and says, what about you? And I got so sick of hearing that over the years uh, saying, you're not, you're not educated. You never went to college. You're, um, you can't drive, you can't do this, you, you know, you can't do that, and they just count off on my fingers, you know, it's, can't do this, can't do that, what else, what else, and so I said, you know what, screw it, I'm going to show you, right, even with having a word in disability, even being half intelligent, and being half, um, accessible, uh, like what you're doing, I say, fuck it. I'm going to show you I can still amount to something. No matter what. Even if it backfires in my face, I'm going to show you I can still amount to something. In 2013, don't ask me why. And I, <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. I did all phone interviews. And, you know, I interviewed people from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Some of them I became friends with. Some of them were one-timers. You know, I became friends with Power Rangers, uh, people, you know, Amazing Spider-Man, Dragon Ball Z. But it was just audio, and I did not want to work with Block Talk Radio. Well, I wanted to, but at the time, it was called Uncensored, and a long, long story short, I dealt with this actress who was a bitch. <laughs> and see, basically, <clears throat> she's a former Power Ranger, and I wanted her on my show. Because I wanted an interview with the Power Rangers. And I told her about the show. And she said no thank you. And the next day she said hey everyone. I'm blah blah blah. And I have a brand new show. It's called Uncensored. It's about mm -hmm. this. 
as well as that one. Son of a, he just, okay, I understand, now I understand, but back then, I overreacted. <laughs> and I was like, really? I, I just told you the whole concept of my show. You said no to me, but now you created your own talk show on the basis of what I told you. And so, you know, there's a long story about that. I apologize. She refused to accept my apology. And her agent were basically assholes. <laughs> long story short. And I was like, and I got people saying, I don't mean to bitch to you. I apologize. No, no. And you're just telling what you've gone through to get where you are. And everybody's got a story. And that just shows that you kept plugging away, even though you had some setbacks. No, absolutely. And the one thing that got to me was like, you have this great format. Why aren't you big or bigger than you portray yourself to be? Why don't you have sponsors? Why don't you have people helping you? Well, would you like to help me with that? No, no. If you can't do it yourself, then it's not meant to be. It's so like, yeah, thanks a lot. And but one guy said to me, do it over and change your format. So thanks to you, we're back up to 280. And basically, I wanted to go, I wanted to do the talk show because I do, <laughs> trying to find the words. I have, yes, I do have poor social skills. I do suffer from depression. I do have pack attacks. And I'm so doing the best, this is therapy for myself. And I'm getting really better time by time. And it's turned me into a better human being. And you basically, you're supposed to, and it still gets me. Once I get to 300, I promise to my listeners, I will stop bitching about this. <laughs> Originally, you were supposed to be 380. Unfortunately, um, you know, my family was saying, you're not copyrighted, you're not trademarked. And so, and at that time, when I interviewed someone, say I interviewed a bunch of your friends, for an example, right. and say, yeah, you know, my agent said, or my publicist said, we didn't like the video quality, because 2013, you're the camera, and this is what it would be recording from. And right. then... Season two would be, okay, here's the camera and what the camera sees from the computer screen. So I recorded from the phone. Then I went to record it directly from the computer screen. Now Skype recorders cut in half. So it now looks like Fox News, CNN. So you saw a transition for all the three years. Unfortunately, that wasn't good enough for some people. And so it is, you were making threats to me. Take it down. I'm gonna sue you. You're hurting my career. We don't want to be seen as people like you. And I'm like, then why did we do the interview in the first place if we didn't want to, you know, be supportive? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Right. So I said, screw it. I called a senior advisor, so I asked lawyer. He said, one, and this is for people out there, if you're doing an online show, you do not have to be copyrighted. If it's online, it's already copyrighted if you have enough of it. Two, do not have to be trademarked. Unless you're making money off it or you have people giving you money. Gotcha. You know, if you're not making money, it's no reason why you should piss away $2,000. And that's why that's a lot of money. You know, $2,000. If you're having money from all these different things, it's like, okay. But... One thing he said, your biggest mistake was, and I promise I will shut up and I will pass it to you. No, it's actually fast. This is interesting because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the industry. Well, so this is, this is actually all very informative to me. No, absolutely. He said, your biggest mistake was you should have had him sign something and says, do I have your permission? And I was in the beginning saying, okay, before we do the interview, Go on the record. Do I have your permission to interview you? And it's like, yeah, that's okay. But then it's like you can edit it. And I, you know, it's, you took one class in. And so now I came up with a permission form. It has my name. Tell you a concept of my show. And it says, do I have your permission to let me interview you and do whatever I want with the interview? As long as I don't sell it for money. 
and it doesn't hurt your image or mine. Yeah. Right. So basically, you know, you sign it. It's just an agreement saying you're giving me permission to use the interview how I like. However, no money will be made on it. And to be honest, it's not it's not something I would like to sell anyway. Maybe in a couple of years, but right now, it's my demo reel. It's a lot of fun together. Right. But um, you know, I should have done that from the start. That was my mistake. And it's just you know, it's a learning experience. You know. So I've done permission forms from the start, and it's just, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do Skype Recorder from the beginning. Yes, you know, season one, I, I'll give you a perfect example. Now, you know, you know how I'm in the big screen and you're in the well box? Mm -hmm. uh, so when my phone used to pick it up, you never saw me, or occasionally you would see me. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, well, I want to get myself out there. So when I was doing it more from the phone, and when I was doing the video quality, you know, season one, I was wearing all tight shirts. I'm very professional. And I was asking questions like, where do you stand on gay rights? Where do you stand on legalizing marijuana? Where do you stand on abortion? You name it, I, I, I covered everything. And it's like, well, I don't want season two to sound repetitive. Well, I wanted to be well dressed back, and so I'm following the season two format. But you know, I'm now passed the show over to you. You know, it's more of a you're making a friend out of it. It's more casual, and yeah. you know, it's just like that. In season four, I might go back to the hard hitting questions for the end of the show and have a little mixture of it, and they wear more professional shirts. But I'm just showing you that there's. A transition. If I did this from the start, yeah, it would have looked nice, but you wouldn't have seen any growth, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it, you have to, you can't, you can't, you know, if you're in business, you definitely, you always got to keep changing. You can't keep it the same. You got to always reinvent yourself. So, yeah, that's what it sounds like you're kind of doing. You, you're keeping it fresh, you're keeping it new. And you're doing something a little bit different every season because, um, yeah, people, they, they want to see new things and different approaches and different topics. And I mean, I think that's, that's, um, why Madonna's been so successful. She <laughs> always reinvents herself. She's, you know, she'll kind of drop out of sight for a little bit and then all of a sudden she's come back and she's something really different and she's, in, she's, that's why he keeps everyone engaged. Or Hulk, look at Hulk Hogan. You know, he, let's see, from 85 to 95, what's that, 10 years, right? Yeah, or about, I suck at math. About 10 years, you know, or about. So from the old 80s, 90s, Hulk Hogan's doing the red and yellow, take your vitamins, say your prayers. And people were saying, okay, we're tired of that. Well, so Hogan disappeared and he came back as a bad guy and that completely opened a whole new door for Hulk Hogan as a bad guy. And I like, okay, now we're tired of seeing Hulk Hogan as a bad guy and now he comes back as a hero. And so it's like, you know, Hulk Hogan's a perfect example for that. You know, it's just you're a hero. Okay, we're tired of it. And then he come back as a villain. And like, oh shit, we, we never seen the Hulk Hogan as a bad guy. And mm -hmm. then he disappears and then he comes back as a hero. And it's, uh, then that started a whole trend with everyone. You know, if, they, you know, if they're a hero and they, you don't see them, but more likely they're going to come back as a bad guy. Or if they're a bad guy and they disappear, they're more likely they're going to become a good guy. Keep people guessing. That's... Yeah, because if you keep people guessing, you keep then they're gonna want more. No, absolutely. You have to, and that's just keep reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna ask you some easy questions. And, okay. Um, then I'm gonna pass it over to you. You can ask me anything you want. This is your time, after all. Mm -hmm. The first one is: When you were growing up, did you ever do any sports? Number one, and number two, when you went to college, were you studying or a party animal? Um, sports. I was really bad at sports. 
Um, I was always the kid that was picked last. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, any sport, I, I don't know. I, I think a lot of the two sports, just playing sports, gives me anxiety. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, I just kind of just did what I had, you know, did the bare minimum playing softball or playing whatever when I was, when I was growing up. And I, poor dad, he, he wanted me so much to be in sports and it just, it just, it just wasn't happening. So, and I think, I think a lot of it is I got teased because I was just so bad and I just like, no, no, this isn't for me. So, but I, I have the utmost admiration for for athletes because they amazing. It's it's so much dedication and it's so much focus. And I I just I, I don't know how to do it. I, I have the utmost respect for them. It's 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 con I mean it's it's not only physically a, a, you know physically challenging, but it's mentally challenging. You gotta always be one step ahead of of um, everybody. I mean you you think about like coaches too. Coaches you know, what they, you know, what they try to, you know, when they're strategizing for every game, it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it blows my mind. Um, and then, you know, when I was watching the Olympics, just seeing um, the swimming, and, you know, every, the December Olympics, what they do is just the gymnasts, and it, it's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, that was a, never, I was never much of a, person um, and college I I did a couple of some I did like one semester after high school and I just I wasn't ready I wasn't focused and um, I kind of just fell into corporate America made a decent living I wasn't I, I wasn't too thrilled with it but um, in later on though when the recession hit I was I was laying off my job and that's when I kind of finally just said, you know, I've always wanted to get into acting and I did um I did go back for like a semester and a half and I mostly I it wasn't I mostly just went because I wanted to I knew the community college um by my house where I was living in California had a really good um had a really good program with a lot of good professors and that taught acting and so that's kind of where I started, and I left for Connecticut January 13th, and I, so I've never, I didn't go back to school, but I, since then, I, I've done a lot of studying, um, like with acting, worked with various coaches, um, and studied at the Actors Gym in Hamden, Connecticut, taken tons of classes at the, um, at, um, Longmore Theater, they, so, yeah, I mean, um, I eventually made it one of the into like a, a, a conservatory program. So, yeah, so that's that's pretty much. Yeah, I, I don't, I know, I don't really have the most conventional. Those probably aren't the most conventional answers, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry but, about. It. Yeah, but when I did, when I was in school, um, it was mostly um, theater, and I did take some general education which was so beneficial i i took um i took a communications class i took political science and uh those those were just i i could i really ate up what i was learning no it's funny you know um you know uh, my brothers were always in the model un you're always in these clubs and mm -hmm. you know what pisses me off was I like, I took basic video, I begged them for four years, and finally they gave in on my last year, but it took me four years to get to basic video. Mm -hmm. And I love this, I love doing the talk show, and I want to do this until I die. This is what I'm very passionate about. About right. what annoys me about the class, and this goes back to my anxiety, was I can, I could do the work, that's fine. But what annoyed me was I had to do group activities. Now it's fine, but back then, with the anxiety, you know, it, it, it flares up. But, um, 
you know, I always fail group activities <laughs> in high school. I always try to avoid it the best I can. But, you know, I failed basic video production, and I'm like, I understand how to use a camera. I know how to do all the videos. So I think this class is a little prejudice or, or rigged because if I'm able to do this, then I can pass a stupid class. You know, it's, he basically failed me because I wanted to do the group activities. Well, I think too. I mean, and that's it, it's not always easy to work in a group. It's 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 not. I um, mean, especially if you've got somebody that's not doing. You, you know, you might have somebody who wants everybody else to do the work for them. Or it is not easy to work in a group. And I think too, um, school isn't always. I mean, I think it's it's great. To, to get an education and get yourself the, as educated as possible because you can never, I mean, it's always great to be learning, 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 but some people just don't learn the typical way in a classroom. I, I that's not, um, I find it hard to sit still. So um, it's easier for me um, to either watch documentaries or to read articles. That's that's the best way I learn. Um, and but yes, it's it's not for everyone. It, it's not for everybody. Some people some people just don't don't function well in a classroom. Um, that's true, and it, it's worse even when you have a word in disability or you're socially awkward. Yeah, it's no, it's it's hard, and and I you know I kind of I. I think I probably struggle with like some eighty because I I have a very hard time sitting and my mind is always going yeah. two hundred miles a minute, so I I tend to kind of zone out a lot and I miss you know I miss important stuff with it. so I learn I learn better say I I would learn better listening to a podcast at my own pace or um, you know or you know, watching a video online on my own. And I, I think that's, we all learn differently. And a lot of times too, I've, I've met so many college graduates that say, oh my gosh, but, you know, you get all this, this education, but it doesn't prepare you for going out into the real world. It doesn't prepare you um, to going out and what it's gonna be like in corporate America or whatever you do. You know, it's funny. I work at this, I won't mention on the air, I can tell you off the air. I worked at this one job and I like working in the back. But, and he thinks, and I do get overwhelmed on the sales floor. And I said, you know, the truth of the matter is why I get overwhelmed being on the sales floor is this crap isn't organized. Oh, you know, the, here's the numbers, eight. 24 and that, what the hell is 824 oh you have to memorize the numbers it's like oh my god why can you just have spring fall winter wow that was easy men mm -hmm. stuff here women stuff here are going to back it was spring summer fall men spring summer fall oh you know you know it's it's corporate, and we have to do it. Corporate doesn't give a shit, you know? You know, like I said, yeah, I don't have no filter, so that freedom of speech, freedom of express. Oh, yeah. The truth is, they don't give a shit. All corporate cares about is making money, making sure people come in, they're buying stuff, and you're making the spoke go around on the wheel, and the wheel, like the hamster on the wheel. The corporation doesn't give a damn that, you know, a hamster is giving again in a hard time. They care about the hamster making a wheel move. And he's like, well, it's been around since the 1920s. It's like, well, it won't go that far. They've been doing it wrong since 100 years. It's, they're not organized. That's why sometimes I like the job and sometimes I want to leave. Because I have a certain plan 
you that you can get more people in because the story makes thousands makes thousands it's a really up there story I can tell you afterwards it makes thousands and if they put more money into it make it look nicer if they put someone like me in charge with disability or not but someone who has the heart and passion to actually gives a damn you get people coming in you get people saying I would love to work with this place it's really amazing and I have people giving me recommendations. Maybe you would like to be one of them. And I can do a recommendation for you too. And saying, you're a, a wonderful person. He's a wonderful person. They know what they're doing. Put them in charge. But instead, you had these stupid corporate yes men that would kiss ass and completely undermine or don't give a damn about what they're doing. And I was like... When I first started, it's like, why don't people want to work here? But after looking around and listening, and after finally it sunk, it sunk in, it's like, no wonder people are quitting. No wonder people are going to the door because you guys don't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah, you got to, like, I find with sales, um, and I think the most simple thing people forget about sales yeah. is that you can't sell, like, this is just how I feel, you can't sell something unless you believe in the product. And you can't, and you also, you have to, you have to take the time and get on a personal level with your customers. Say, you know, find out what they're looking for. What's, what, what is it they want? You know, find out something personal about them. Um, it's, and you do that, don't, don't, you know, worry about quota. Like, I remember I, I worked, um, I worked at a spa, I was part of person, and I was supposed to have a quota every month of selling these outrageous skincare products. And I didn't really believe in the product because every time I used it, like, my face either broke out or it was just, yeah. you know, and it was like 70 bucks for face cream. And I just said, I all in good conscience can't push this. But I believed in the services because I knew we had really good massage therapists that cared. I knew we had really good estheticians that give people, um, you know, great service as well. So they kept me, like, I never met my salesman, <laughs> but... I, but I did a lot with selling our services because I did believe in our services. And I would create, um, I create a lot of really successful events on social media on our Facebook page where I'm in a lot of business. So I think, I think they kind of, they saw, okay, it balances out. But, yeah, I just kept saying, I'm sorry. I, I can't. I said, I, I haven't had a good experience with, with these products. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna push them, and uh, I I never got fired, but <laughs> I guess but I guess it balanced out because they they saw I brought in business elsewhere. But yeah, that's the thing. It's like you gotta you gotta believe in what you're doing, and I have a um, I also work as a brand ambassador, and I work with a company, the startup company right now um, that's developed in a completely organic baby food. And I I don't have kids, I, I mean I have any kids and nephews, but they took the time to really educate me. And you know, they, they took the time. Um, they created a really good PowerPoint presentation. And I said, you know, this is easy for me to sell. This is a really good product and I think this is a great um, this is great for kids, and it's going to teach kids what um, you know what natural products taste like. So they, you know, when they get older and they realize, oh my gosh, this is that you know when they start eating candy and stuff, they know oh, you know I I know what I, something natural tastes like. So I have no problem talking to people and selling it because I believe in the product. And they didn't. They don't ever push me or anything, but. They don't have to because I, I know what they've come out with is a really good quality product. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
And I didn't, I apologize. I didn't mean to just uh, give you all that drama. I, I just. Oh, drama. I think it's, a, I think it's a very important subject what we're talking about that what I think you have an extremely valid, um, valid point that if a company, if they don't take the time to do educate their employees and find out what their employees want and create an environment where they're happy. That's the one thing that, that you've got to make sure your employees are happy. Because if you don't have employees, happy employees, there's you're not going to your company's not going to succeed. No, oh, absolutely. And now right. the last subject I want to talk to you and talk to you about, and I'm gonna pass it over to you. But the one thing I do want to talk to you about is who influenced you to start your career. And how many years have you been doing it? And I'm finishing up the show. It's completely on you. And I'll pass it over to you now. Um, I think it was, it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really any one particular person. I think it was just, it was kind of, you know, I, 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 I kind of just thought not going after what I really wanted to do for so long. And, and I just said, you know what, I said, I said I, enough, what, why am I, why am I starving myself from that and or of that? And so it was kind of, it, it just, it was just when, when I started to um, realize that that, you know, if I'm not doing what I love, then I'm not going to give my best and make a difference to everyone and everything around me. And that was, that was basically what, um, what really, um, pushed me and okay, you know what, actually I do, um, and, oh gosh, and I can't think of her last name right now. Oh, her name is, is Sam Smith. There was, um, what was this? Was I think it was 2010. This um, Jan Smith, Mountain Smegla, she is she runs a human resources um, consulting firm. And you remember back in 2010? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't do this before. But to be honest, I remember this. What we did is I was um, trying to get a job back in corporate America, trying every which way going to these cattle called job fairs and I didn't even want to go back and you know that's not what I wanted to do and so she held these free seminars for the city and she said um she basically kind of said each one basically said about how to promote yourself and one thing she did say that really had an impact on me is she says she said if you're in doing something job wise that you don't like it's not going to work out for you. Yeah. And I just realized, yeah, um, these it, it's not working. What I was doing working in corporate America wasn't, you know, I you know I still do work in corporate America, but it wasn't working out for me because I wasn't using the creative side that I wanted it to. And I and that was the real turning point for me. I said, um, I said, you know, I if this right now. It's not what I want to do, and that's when I started looking, um, looking into going back to school and and um, pursuing acting. No, absolutely. Yeah. Now wrapping up your talk show, I took this from Bill O'Reilly, so all rights go to the factor. But as going on the record, the spin stops here. But <laughs> yeah, I do like the factor. So going on the record, when I first approached you. What was your honest opinion? And after doing the interview, how do you feel now? Well, I remember you had um, Fred requested me on um, Facebook, and and I just kind of I read you know your story and what you're doing. And I said, oh my goodness! I, I said I, I got to meet this guy. I I you know I I just really I really wanted to, and, and I it was it was an honor that that you kind of sought me out and wanted to, to interview me yourself, so 
Yeah, I have the utmost, um, utmost respect for you. And I, I think what you're doing is awesome. Keep, keep, keep doing it. No, absolutely. And what do you say for all those naysayers out there that don't believe in me or want nothing to do with me? What I have to say to those people is I think that you say that because, or they say that because um, they've forgotten what they what their dreams are. And they're scared to go after what they really want in life or they feel that they can't do it. And maybe they're they're just saying that out of fear. And or maybe they're they're trying to protect people around them because they did try to go after what they wanted in life and it didn't work out and they're trying to to protect other people, but yeah, don't if if you if you're doing that if this if you're trying to you know if you're saying that because you're trying to protect people or you're you're scared of um, of going out going after what you really want don't don't be it's never too late to start over life it's never too late and you know I'll reiterate what I said if you're not doing what you truly love you're not giving your best. To everyone and everything around you, you're not giving your best to your other, you're not giving your best to kids, your your children, your relatives, your friends. So it's just something to keep in mind. No, absolutely. Now, how can people fall wrapping up? How can people follow you on social media? Are you on LinkedIn, Twitter, Stage 32? Um, I I need to get more into Stage 32. Um but yes, I am. I am on Twitter. You can find me at I'm Bryn B R Y N, Aaron E R I N Berg B E R G, and I'm on Instagram Brynberg74, and um, I am on LinkedIn also Bryn Brynberg. Or um, I and I do have a website www.brynberg.com. And you can always feel free to find me on Facebook. I'm Brynberg. <laughs> Now, wrapping up your segment, you have a couple questions for you off the air. For wrapping up, I just want to say it's a real honor and privilege to have you as a guest, and I'm looking forward to building a friendship with you as well. Thank you so much for having me.